Good morning, everybody. The Lord be with you. I've got several announcements this morning, some from Epworth by the Sea. First of all, if you didn't have that delicious breakfast this morning, I feel sorry for you, but those people did a wonderful, those kids did a great job. And thank you, Celia, and all Jody and Hans and all the people who helped prepare, the parents who helped everyone. It was a lovely morning, a great way to start, and it was just fabulous. We had lots of fellowship going on, and let's thank you. Um, this week, we, at, right after this service today at 12 o'clock, there will be an SPR meeting in the pastor's office. At 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock, a youth planning meeting for parents, and at 6 o'clock, the snack supper for all youth, followed by MYF till 8 p.m. On Monday at 12 p.m., is that the correct time, Miss Penny? 12? Okay. At 12, there will be a United Methodist Women call to prayer and self-denial in the fellowship hall. At 5.30 until 7, bicycle repairs. 6 o'clock, the UMW Lydia Fellowship, and that will be in the Welcome Center. At 7 p.m., Boy Scouts in the Annex. On Tuesday, we have United Methodist Women Mary Martha Fellowship. 6 p.m., Martial Arts in the Miller Building. And at 6.30, the Venture Crew in the Annex. On Wednesday, don't forget about the Family Night Supper. And if you don't have reservations, make sure you give those to Melinda. Call the church office. At 6.15, adult and youth, just following the dinner, Bible studies and children's programs. 6.15, handbells, 7 o'clock, choir practice. On Thursday, 6 p.m., martial arts class in the Miller Building. And at 6 p.m., the United Methodist Women, our new group, I believe, Esther. Fellowship in the Welcome Center, all the young people. We got to say young United Methodist Women Group. And we're so excited to have them. Um, the UMW will honor the babies, the 213 babies, on March the 9th. So don't forget that. If you have a child or a grandchild that was born in 2013, please complete a form. And those forms are available in the Sunday school classrooms. Uh, and return it to the church office as quickly as possible. And now, as my put on my Epworth hat for a few minutes, um, Connectional Ministries, in partnership with Epworth by the Sea, on March 14th through the 16th, will have a confirmation retreat. Now, this retreat is for um, children and youth, fifth grade and above. And it's only $50. And for people not in the conference, it's $125. So you see we get a break. But it's $50 for the whole weekend. Lots of wonderful, wonderful learning opportunities for these children and youth. Um, registration forms can be printed at www.etworthbybasee, one word, dot org. So please go on and check those out. And in March 10th through the 13th, there'll be a Eugenia Price event, No Stranger to Savannah, and uh, it's all about her Savannah series. So if you're interested in Eugenia Price right here in our area, then that will be for you. And you can go online again and uh, register. There's still some flower calendar dates available. If you have one of those dates, if you would like to, to put flowers in the church, Please call the church office about that and talk to Melinda or leave a message. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. But before we do, I'd like to say that we are happy to have with us, and we welcome him, a guest pianist. His name is Cameron, another Cameron, imagine that, Cummings. And he's right here, and we're just so happy to have him with us. Another middle Georgia young man. Let us prepare our hearts for worship.
62 as we stand and sing together. Stand up and bless the Lord. Will you stand as we sing? Number 662. This is the traditional Apostles' Creed. Let us unite our hearts together in this historic affirmation of our Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. AD. And 
Back then, the Roman Empire was run by a leader called an emperor. And during that time, the emperor said that all the soldiers could not get married because he said when the soldiers went out to fight and conquer land under the Roman Empire, that when they were married, they were more scared and they weren't willing to take all the risks that a soldier should be willing to take because they were worried about their life back at home or their families. So the emperor outlawed marriage. Well, Valentine was a priest in the Catholic Church at the time. It was the only church back in the third century. And he just couldn't imagine that that would be okay to not let people that loved each other get married and share in the covenant that God had given his people. And so he secretly married people and said, if they want to be together and they love each other, I'm going to unite them in holy matrimony. And so he did. And eventually he was thrown in jail and he was sentenced to a very nasty three-part death. And he was a martyr who died for a cause that he thought that God's people should be able to share and love with one another. And his very last letter that left his jail cell before he died said, Sincerely, your Valentine. And so that's where we come up with Valentine's Day. So Valentine's Day isn't just about romantic love. It's really about God's love for his people, and that's what we're celebrating when we carry on the tradition many, many, many centuries later. So we'll talk about St. Valentine upstairs a little more and discuss what it means to us today. And let's go to God and thank him for giving us these type of people in the world that allow his love to be spread. Father God, we thank you for your love and your only son, Christ Jesus who showed the ultimate love. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to go upstairs nice and slow together. Thank you, Celia. And they, they really did a wonderful job for us uh, for our love breakfast this morning. It was a great turnout, and thank you for being here. And Sunday school teachers, thank you for giving up your class and letting us have this, uh, have this moment before Thanksgiving. Uh, now, do we have any first-time visitors, very first-time visitors this morning? I, I'm missing something, I'm sure. What did I say? Thanks. Did I say Thanksgiving? I am so far ahead of the rest of y'all. Huh? That's all I can say. <laughs> Valentine's Day. Okay. First-time visitors. Who's a first-time visitor? We have gift bags for first-time visitors. Anybody who's a very first-time visitor? Okay. We want to say thank you, thank you and welcome to our visit. We do have a first-time visitor over here, Jimmy. Right over here next to Edie. Okay. And then one over here on this side. Okay. Y'all got those marked. Okay. Now, th this is the last time I'm going to take advice uh, from this congregation on how to bet on the Super Bowl. I'm, that's all I'm going to say, okay? No. Let's stand and greet someone. Tell them you're glad to see them here this morning. <laughs> I can't believe I said that. Test one, two. I'm gonna give you the. Go ahead and give you the mic, okay? It's off. I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain. the pew pads please and fill them out send them down to the end and send them back so we can see who you're worshiping with today these beautiful altar flowers today 
are given in loving memory of Dr. Allen and Dorothy Delavet by their family. The other arrangement is given by Re uh, Reverend Eddie and Pat Ratcliffe in celebration of their ninth wedding anniversary on February the 12th, 2014. Um, I think this has been updated. Miss Jane told me we, it, we didn't have anybody listed in the hospital, but now we understand Eddie is in the hospital. Oh, okay. Jim will give us an update on that. In the Senior Care Center for Rehab is Annie Louise Carswell. In Magnolia Manor for Rehab is Bill Miller. He's in room 101. And please, remember to pray for Eddie Ratcliffe, Cappy Duvall, Jessica Wilson, Cindy Sayre, Martha Miller, Marie Cooper, Barbara Roach, Lee Langford, Jimmy Langford, who we're happy to see in the back today, and Adam Kasadowski. And please continue to pray for our military, Scotty Bennett, John Patrick Thornton, Charles Wells, A.J. Schaefer, Paxton Edgy, and Jake Johnson. Also remember, on the mission field, we have the Lovelace, Great House, and Trousdale families. Don't forget to include them in your prayers. Do we have any other prayer requests today? First of all, I want to say it's good to see George here this morning. George had cataract surgery this week, and we didn't think he was going to be here, but we're glad that he's here this morning. And then... Uh, to let you know about Eddie. Eddie is in the hospital with a bad, bad infection that affected his shoulders. Now, Eddie's got multiple health issues, but uh, the infection has forced the separation of his shoulder. And so he's going to be operated on this afternoon. And uh, so keep Eddie in your prayers, uh, complications of dialysis and all of that kind of thing. So please, uh, please keep Eddie and Pat um, in your prayers. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. We'll take a few moments to lift up our prayers uh, silently before the Lord, and then we'll join our hearts together. So will you join me as we pray? Father God, we're grateful for the expression of love that we felt during the Sunday school uh, hour when our children served us. They, children can do so many things that are representative of the kingdom of God in so many ways, in such good ways. And that's the reason that Jesus took a child and set him in their midst and said, unless you become like one of these. And Lord, remind us what it's like to love unconditionally. When a baby comes into this world, it will love anything, anytime, anyone anywhere, any place, and there are no conditions on that love. It's only as we grow older and grow into our young adult and adult lives that we learn how to put conditions upon our love. But Lord, it ought also to remind us that there is a God who loves us unconditionally. Father, your love for us has never changed. It will never change no matter what we do, what we say. Father, your love will always be the same for us and we are grateful for that but because you have first loved us then the word of God tells us that we can learn what it means to love one another and so we pray that love for one another will grow we pray that our love for you will grow thereby causing us to want to love others as we love ourselves and fulfilling the great commandment so father speak to our hearts this morning as we worship together as we look at hope as a refuge, we pray that you would open your word to our hearts and to our mind's eyes and help us to see you for who you are. There have been names that have been lifted up before the throne of heaven this morning for special needs. We pray that you would meet those needs. Father, there are those who are going through difficulties and sickness. We pray for the hand of God to move upon them. We pray, Father, for those who stand and guard the gates of freedom for this country. We pray for your protection. We pray for those who lift up the cause of Christ in other countries. We pray for the peace of your protection and the multiplying of the gospel as it goes forth. Now, Father, bless us as we worship together this morning. Touch 
our hearts, each and every one. We pray these things in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who taught us and his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This morning is number 92 for the beauty of the earth. We'll sing uh, verses 1, 2, 5, and 6. So we stand as we sing together 1, 2, 5, and 6 for the beauty of the earth. Thank you. 
standing, if you will, for the reading of God's word. text this morning is taken from the book of Lamentations, from which I personally don't preach much. Lamentations chapter 3, this beautiful passage of scripture has, I could count at least six songs in Christendom over the years that have been uh, produced from this passage of scripture. These four brief verses, and I confess to you that I'm taking them out of context completely. And you need to understand the context in order to understand the great assertions that are made in this text. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 26. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. May God add the blessing of understanding to the reading of his word. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, and please be seated. Now, Cameron, I want to say thank you to Cameron and you, Cameron. Thank you for visiting, being here today. And to the choir, you've blessed our hearts. And thank you, that wonderful hymn. Uh, someone was explaining the difference to me, and um, I, I guess I had to have the difference explained to me. So many of the great hymns that were written in past years were written dealing with the individual and their relationship to God. And uh, whether or not that relationship was real, and you could think of the words or the stanzas of hymns, but it had to do with the, with the singer of the hymns and their relationship to the Almighty. Whereas in the contemporary church, there's more of an understanding that there is praise that goes before the throne. Now, I, I'm not one who thinks that these types of musics are mutually exclusive because they're not at all. In fact, you'll see in our lineup, we call... Uh, basically our first hymn, uh, uh, a hymn of praise, and then we call it a hymn of preparation, and uh, designed more or less to, to be worshipful, but there is that thought where, where music needs to bring us into the presence of God. But at the same time, where I think the contemporary church lacks today is that there is not as much cause for introspection. Uh, what kind of shape am I in when I come into the presence of God? And when I come into his court to worship him, the psalmist had, a, had an incredible sense of who he was when he writes in the 23rd Psalm, who shall ascend unto the hill of God or who shall stand before the seat of the Almighty? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the God of his salvation. There needs to be both. There really needs to be both. But we know when our hearts have been touched, and our hearts were touched this morning by the music, and Cameron, of course, singing How Great Thou Art, and it, it's blessed our, blessed our hearts this morning. Now, today I want us to look at another in the series on hope, and hope as a refuge today. Now, in order for us to understand hope as a refuge, we need to understand the context for the verses that we read as our text this morning. And that is very simply this. Jeremiah was known, and as many of you know, especially those of you who have taught Sunday school at some time or other on the, on the Old Testament, Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet uh, who sat by the rivers of Babylon and weeped uh, for his people and weeped for Jerusalem. Now, the, the thing about the lamentations of Jeremiah is that Jeremiah is weeping over the funeral of a city. Uh, even though the Assyrian captivity had happened almost 100 years before this time, 721 uh, B.C., there was uh, that time when Israel regained some of its strength and Jerusalem was, uh, not, not much had happened to Jerusalem phys physically in the Assyrian captivity, which was the first captivity. But now the second captivity was the Babylonian captivity. It took place in four parts. 
And if you ever remember the stories of Daniel in the lion's den, you remember the stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, the fiery furnace and the four children of Israel who were not burned by, or the three that were not burned by the fire. And then uh, the king looked into the flames and he said, I see one like unto the Son of Man as the four walking about and not a hair of their head was singed nor the smell of fire the word says or smoke on their clothes now this is when those things occurred because you see Babylon came in Jeremiah had seen through the prescience that God gave to his prophets things to warn Israel about listen to a prophet listen to a prophet God had warned Israel that there were things that were going to happen. He told them very plainly, not hidden at all, not in any kind of code, but in their language and in the language of the heart, what was going to happen. He told King Zedekiah, do not make a union with the Egyptians. Wrong thing to do, wrong way to go as a nation. And that's exactly what Zedekiah did. He he watched on the world scene as things were happening and the Assyrians had taken over the Babylonians and I mean the Babylonians had taken over the Assyrian Empire and it looked to Zedekiah in his wisdom as a leader of Israel that the best alliance that would preserve the peace for Jerusalem would be to unite with the world's strongest army and that was the Egyptians and it was the wrong thing to do complete disobedience utter disobedience to God and Babylon surrounds Jerusalem after defeating the battle of the the Egyptians at the battle of Carchemish now some of you all of a sudden your little your your history reservoir is clicking there with that name Carchemish and 605 BC comes to life and you remember there were naval battles as well as land battles but the Egyptians were totally defeated by the Babylonians and then they come after Israel and they surround Jerusalem and they ransack it and not only and this is where by the way you might be interested to know that a lot of historians believe that maybe the Ark of the Covenant was taken from the temple because you see this was the destruction of the temple that great incredible structure covered in so much gold we can't even imagine its physical worth today we can't even imagine such a structure as it truly was with the amount of gold that was in it They tore it apart, literally. They took the walls of Jerusalem apart. They murdered. They took the princes. They took the best looking. They took the wisest and the smartest. And they took them to Babylon. Hence the stories of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Babylon just destroyed Israel and they think that maybe this is where the Ark of the Covenant made its way into Iraq and you know the story of Indiana Jones and the Ark of the Covenant and so on all that mess that was made a movie and so on a lot of fun to watch but this is where they think that the Ark when they think the Ark might have left Israel taken by the Babylons and the prophet Jeremiah is just beside himself in fact I wish I could read you a couple of couple of passages time does not permit but uh, to read the agony that you sense in this man's life in chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Lamentations you see the first five uh, chapters of the book of Lamentation are a dirge over a funeral a a funeral over a, a city that has died over Jerusalem and he sees the agony that has become Zion he sees the destruction And then he moves into chapter 3, and chapter 3 becomes an identification of what the agony that the prophet feels in his own heart and life. I'm the man who's seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He's led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. My my flesh has aged on my skin. My skin has aged in my flesh and broken my bones. He's besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and, and woe. That's just a little sample, but you get catch the idea that here's a here's a man in the deep, dark agony of things that have happened in life around him. Now listen, sometime you may find yourself sitting in the same seat that the prophet Jeremiah was sitting in. 
it seems like everything around you that was so good and so fine and so sturdy and so whole has suddenly fallen apart. And that which you stood upon for security in your life is no longer there. The earth has moved. And how, how terrible is it when that which we've counted on maybe for years in our life has just begun to crumble. Where do you go? What do you do? How do you act? And I, I, I've got the military channel, and I, I love, you know I'm a student of history, and I love history. I was watching one of those black and white pictures, color World War II, you know, World War II in color, that the, I think the Turner Network took on as a project years ago. I was watching one of these films, and everything was, was the film was made in black and white from the American perspective, and then it was that color was added to it. Now, with the color added to it, there was I was watching a, a platoon of, of young GIs marching through a German town that had just been destroyed. And literally, even though color was added, there wasn't any color. It was all dark gray and, and just shadows of, of things, just destruction. I mean, walls tumbled down buildings, and everything almost was in black and white. And then all of a sudden, to the to the eye, you catch this bright red. Because you see, the people who are adding color to the film have spotted something in the mid of, middle of that destruction that stands out incredibly. And as these boots are marching through this dusty town, shoulder, rifles slung over their shoulders, death and destruction all around, there's the bright red of a rose that is somehow growing in a garden that doesn't even exist anymore. In the midst of all of that, all of that, here is a, a bright red rose. And it's the only thing of, of color in this, in this scene. And you see, all of a sudden, in the midst of this desperation and the darkness and the despair that Jeremiah feels over watching his beloved city come to crumbs, nothing left, not even people, and yet his soul breaks forth in this praise. How do you do that? His soul comes out with some of the things that have spoken to our hearts, just like how great thou art speaks to our hearts, just like just as I am speaks to our hearts, just like there are things that speak to our hearts because they are real. And they are significant spiritually. I, I want that. I want to know that. And, and suddenly, out of the deep darkness of his life, this rose burst forth. Like I said, from which hymns have come. You, you recognize some of the words. And I, I want you to notice just three things quickly this morning. The first point is simply this. The prophet Jeremiah, in the middle of his despair and darkness, says these words. Uh, what he means, my point is this, point number one. God's mercies will not allow us to be consumed. God's mercies will not allow us to be consumed. Now listen, if ever there was a people that needed to understand this truth, it was the Jewish people. The Assyrians were bad enough, but they weren't quite as bad as the Babylonians. The Babylonians were bad enough, but they weren't quite as bad as Hitler. God's mercies, the prophet writes, will never let us be consumed. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. And the introduction to this triad in the way, the, the way these five chapters are constructed in the book of Lamentations, it's a, it's a Hebrew uh, structure of writing in, in literature. But verse 21 in this chapter, and if you've got your Bible open to this text, you can see these words. This is how he introduces the text that we read to you this morning. This I recall to my mind, and therefore I have hope. Do you, do you hear that? This I recall to my mind, and therefore I have hope. Then read the text, 22 through 26.
What does it take for you to be reminded in the desperation of the experiences of your life to be reminded of God's promises? To be reminded that this is not the end. To be reminded that this is not over. Whatever it is that you're experiencing is not the final word in your life. Now, you see, there's some for whom situations happen in life and they take the final word into their own hands. And we heard about one this morning, a local family, and I trust for those of you that know about that situation that you will keep them in your prayers. But this person decided that they were going to have the final word in their life. But you see, the prophet said, Through God's mercies, I will not be consumed. I recall these things, and therefore I have hope. Now listen, I want you to get the true concept of mercy here because it's easy for us to use the term mercy and grace. There's a song in the Cokesbury uh, called Love, Mercy, and Grace. It is a Methodist hymn if ever there was one. How many of you know Love, Mercy, and Grace? Okay, a few of us do. We need to get the Cokesbury out sometime and and sing that song again. It it is a powerful song. But what's the difference between grace and mercy? Let me just tell you very quickly. Grace, as you know, I hope that you know from attending this church, that grace is unmerited love. You, You can do nothing to merit the love of God. It is God's unconditional love. But what is mercy? What is mercy? You see, the concept of mercy is connected to withholding judgment. You and I deserve something that God's not going to give us. You and I deserve something because of what we've done, because of what we've said, because of what we have done to others. But you see, God in His mercy and because of the cross of Christ is not going to make us pay that price. And that, friend, is God's mercy. Now, there's a promise that God gives about mercy, and this is the reason that parents need to be diligent to bring up their children in the love and admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the things of the church and in the things of God. In Psalm 103, mercy, listen, mercy, God's withholding judgment is promised to generations that follow him and that believe him. I I trust in that promise. And I pray for my children like Job prayed for his children. Lord, maybe they've done something. They don't understand how displeasing it is. Have mercy upon them. And the psalmist said that he gives mercy unto generations. Now, the second point when hope becomes a refuge is simply this. God's mercies, you see, that, that judgment that we should get, but we're not going to get everything that we deserve. God's mercies the prophet says, are new and fresh every day. It's new and fresh every day. Every day is a new day. And how you look at it depends upon your understanding of how God has extended His mercy to you. There is a parable that Jesus relates in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. It is called the parable of the unmerciful servant. Now, how can a servant be unmerciful? Well, you see, he owed a million dollars to his master. We're rounding off, okay? He owed a million dollars to his master. No hope of his ever making a million dollars. He was a servant. And Jesus said he was taken before his master. His debt was called. There was a call on the stock market. Bring a million dollars in. And he went before his master. And he begged for his life and the life of his family. He said, there's no way I can pay this. No way. And then Jesus said very simply that the master forgave him all of his debt. He forgave him all of it. Now, the next next day is a new day for this man. It's a new day for this man. Because, you see, he's been forgiven. He's a free man. Now he goes out into the street. He put his feet on the floor. Thank you, Lord, for this new day. Thank you for the sun that came up. Thank you that I've got some good things to see and do this day. And his friend sees his friend in the alley. 
And he says, you owe me 10 bucks. And his friend says, I can't pay you the 10 bucks. He said, if you don't give me 10 bucks, I'm going to throw you in jail. And he did. And then Jesus said, the master, when he heard what the servant had done for $10, got this man again and put him in jail and said, you're going to stay there until you pay the entire million dollars. You see, every day the Lord's mercies are new and fresh. Will you remember that? As you go about your life, and the way that you treat and love somebody else, God's mercy to you is new and fresh. And I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Help me to be as merciful to somebody else as you've been to me. The third point is this. God's presence allows us to hope and wait for God's rescue. And this is what the prophet wrote. He said, it is good. It is good, in verse 24, to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him, it is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. We wait, and this is where hope becomes a refuge. This is where hope becomes a refuge. We wait for God's salvation. Let, let me say to you this morning that, no, I'm, my mic's not working, so I'm going to stay behind the pulpit for just a second. I, I see things taking place in the world around me. And I ask the question sometimes of God that I have people sometimes ask of me as a preacher. Preacher, why doesn't the Lord just wipe out all evil on this earth? And when I, I, I heard something heinous this week, I, I'm not going to repeat it. I don't need to tell you anything new that you haven't heard or know about. But especially when it happens to children. And I just think, Lord, how long? How long? Why, why don't you just come and wipe evil off the face of this earth? And then do you know what comes to me? The Lord said, the day is coming. The day is coming when it will happen. It is coming when the day will happen when God's judgment will come upon the earth. And you know what? Then in my heart, I can hope and wait quietly for God's salvation. And hope becomes my refuge and I hope that hope can become your refuge now this morning I'm going to ask uh, Mary Brooke Brent, Carly and Cece uh, to come to the front, the Kersey's they're going to unite with the fellowship of our church we're going to receive them as our newest members and after we uh, do that we're going to sing verse 1 of Be Still My Soul which is number 534, we'll receive the Kersey's first and then you turn to number 534, and we'll sing one verse together, and you will have the opportunity to welcome these folks into the membership of our church. Now, if you all will come and face this daunting congregation here, okay? And we'll ask you all the question that we ask of all of those. And they are transferring, by the way, transferring from another United Methodist Church into the fellowship of our church here. I'm delighted to have them. I said at the 845 service that they were coming by way of that service. They've attended that service more, but I asked them when they joined if they would come here this morning so that you could meet them and see them. And I appreciate the fact that Carly's already been serving. Carly Scott has already been serving as an acolyte in our church. So we ask you all the question that we ask of all of those transferring their membership, and that is, will you be loyal to this church and uphold it by your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? And be the first to extend the right hand of Christian fellowship to you. And again, thank you for being willing to be an acolyte. You see, Cecilia, but they call her Cece, so you can call her Cece, okay? Let's stand together and sing in closing verse number one of number 534, Be Still My Soul.
take us from this place understanding that you are in control. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.